All right, we're going to begin a new series entitled Overwhelmed by Grace. Overwhelmed by Grace. Uh, turn to Romans chapter 4, please. And as you're turning to Romans 4, let me tell you why I chose this title. When we were on vacation, uh, the Lord began to speak to me about grace. And I started sharing with Debbie some things God was showing me about grace. And while I was telling her, I was completely overwhelmed again by God's grace. Now, every one of us who have been saved have been overwhelmed by the saving grace of God. Whenever you get saved, you're overwhelmed by the fact of your sin and by the incredible gift of God's grace. But what I want us to do is to live overwhelmed by grace. I want us to be overwhelmed not just by saving grace, but by sustaining grace. And there are a lot of Christians that understand that it took God's grace to save them, but feel like that somehow it is on their own merit that they will be sustained. And I understand that we agree and work with and cooperate with God's grace, but it is still God's grace working in us. One of the scriptures that I wrote on one of the beams was 1 Corinthians 15, 10, which says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain because I labored more than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God in me. And that's the way I feel. I, I believe that God's grace toward me is not in vain because I'm laboring. I'm, I'm working in his field, but it's really not me. It's God's grace in me, and I'm responding to that grace. So I want to show you a passage here in Romans chapter 4 and, and talk about grace for a little while, all right? Romans chapter 4, look at verse 1. And I don't want to just read it too fast. I want us to catch what the Bible is saying. Romans 4 verse 1, What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now we're going to come back to that verse in a little while. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Now, let me tell you something about this passage. This is a great passage of scripture if you've ever done anything wrong. If you're here and you've never done anything wrong, then this passage will not relate to you. But if you've ever done anything wrong, it's good. You know why? Because it says he justifies the ungodly by grace. And that's good for every one of us. Now, it's extremely important that we understand grace and legalism. It's very important. And let me tell you why. You look at everything in your life either by grace or by legalism. You look at everything in your life either as a gift or as earned. You, you see God according to your understanding of grace. You see yourself according to your understanding of grace. You see others according to your understanding of grace. Let me give you another word for legalism. Um, That'll help you. You may not like this word, but let me, this, is, this, is, this is another, this is my word for legalism, all right? Perfectionism. Because you see, with God, if you're going to keep the law, you have to keep the whole law. It's, it's perfectionism. And the problem is that legalism affects every area of our life. Um, let me give you another illustration. If you go to the guy on the street, let's say you just go to one of these shopping centers or malls around here, and, and you, you, you just interview people just walking down the street, and you say to them, what do you have to do to go to heaven? To be, this is a, just, just someone walking down the street. What, what is the most common answer you're going to receive when you say to someone, what do you have to do to get to heaven? What are you going to hear? Be good. be good. Be a good person. Be good. Right? Or they may say it this way, do more good than bad. Okay. Here's the only problem with that. God's standard is not good. It's perfect. So 
So even if you have more good than bad, you still haven't met the requirements. Um, now, I'm going to ask a question, and I know no one's going to raise your hand. I, I, just, I, I, know, I understand, and you'll, you'll see why I'm going to ask the question. But is there anyone here who has broken every law there is? I mean, every, every law. Anyone here broken every law there is? Okay? All right, let, let me read you a verse. I, I'm going to read it out of the Living Bible because I like this version. Watch this. James 2.10 says, And the person who keeps every law of God but makes one little slip is just as guilty as the person who has broken every law there is. All right, let me ask another question, see if anyone raises your hand on this one. Is there anyone here who has made one little slip? Can I see your hand? Okay. You should have raised your hand a moment ago then. Because I just read a verse in the Bible, even though I read it in the Living Bible, I know it's a paraphrase, New King James says, if anyone keeps the whole law and stumbles at any point, he's guilty of all. He's guilty of breaking them all. So we're, we're just as guilty. Just one little slip. Why? Because God's standard is perfectionism. Perfect. So how in the world am I ever going to get to heaven if I have to be perfect? Or is it possible that someone's already been perfect and I can believe in him? The, the verse, verse 3 there is the verse I want to key in on for the message. For what, Romans 4, verse 3. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God. That's the first part of this. I want to divide it into three parts. Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him. That means put in his account. For righteousness. So those three things. We're going to talk about Abraham believed. It was accounted for righteousness. But I'm going to do it in reverse order, right? So here's number one. Number one is, what is righteousness? What is righteousness? If I said to you, uh, Pastor Todd is a righteous man. He's a, he's a righteous man. If I said that, what do you think then about Pastor Todd? What, what would be your natural... Thoughts. Well, you would think that he does right things. If he's a righteous man, then he lives righteously. You know, he treats his wife right. Uh, he's a good husband. He's a good father. Uh, he's just. He's moral in his behavior, his character. It, you know, he's not perfect, but I mean, he, he, he doesn't lie. He doesn't cheat. He doesn't steal. He, he, he lives righteously. Now, because I'm preaching on grace and works, this is going to shock you what I'm about to say. If I said to you he's a righteous person and your assumption is that means he lives righteously, listen to me, that's a right assumption. That's a, that's a good assumption. It's not a wrong assumption. But I have a question for you. Does he live righteously? No, let me say it this way. Is he righteous because he lives righteously? Or does he live righteously because he's righteous? <laughs> See, that changes everything. That's grace versus legalism. See, he's not righteous because he lives righteously. But he lives righteously because he's righteous. Now, I, the question was, what is righteousness? Well, I, I, I hate it when I hear a preacher ask a question and then he doesn't answer it, you know? So let me give you the answer. Righteousness is right standing with God. That's what the word means. Righteousness means right standing with God. Well, here's what we need to understand, though. I am not in right standing with God because I do right things, because I can't do enough right things. I am in right standing with God because Jesus did right things, and I believe in Jesus. And because of my right standing with God, I now have a desire to do right things. But I don't always do right things. But I want to do right things. But it's not my right things that puts me in right standing with God. All right, let me ask it another way. Can an unrighteous man, in other words, a man who's not in right standing with God, can an unrighteous man do a righteous deed? All right, let me ask it again. Some of you didn't, didn't uh, think, so let me, can, can I, uh, let's just, let's say it this way, all right. 
there's a guy, he, he doesn't know the Lord, he's, he's not a believer, he goes to another city uh, on a job thing, he has a great job day, he, he signs up new accounts, one of them a huge account, uh, and he's going to get great bonuses off of it. That night he's feeling great, he takes a walk from his hotel room, and uh, he's walking down the street, and a ball comes over a fence, his kids are playing, he picks the ball up and throws it back to the kids. A uh, little old lady, uh, he helps her across the street, he sees a homeless man, he gives him some money, um, are those right things? Do, they're, they're good things, right? But do those things make the unrighteous man righteous? Okay, uh, let me give you another illustration. Uh, there's a guy who's a believer, loves the Lord, uh, goes to church, great guy, is saved, uh, goes to another city, has a bad day in business. Goes for a walk that night, uh, walks by a park, a ball comes over the fence from some kids playing, and he kicks the ball in the street. A uh, little old lady trying to get across the street, asking for help. Uh, he just kind of brushes by her, bumps her, she falls in a puddle. <laughs> Homeless man uh, asks for money, and he says to him, you know, you ought to get a job, and kicks him, and cur get, he even says a curse word. <laughs> he's a believer, but he's having a bad day. Okay, do those, those are unright, those are bad deeds. Those are unrighteous, they're not right. Do those unrighteous deeds make the man who is in right standing with God, is he not in right standing with God anymore because of that? All right. So let me, let me, all right, now here's the question. Can an unrighteous man do a righteous deed? Yes or no? Yes, okay. Does the righteous deed that the unrighteous man does make him righteous? Okay, listen to me carefully because this is where we missed it. Can a righteous man do an unrighteous deed? Yes, you've done many. <laughs> does the unrighteous deed that the righteous man does make him unrighteous? Then why do you live that way? Because we do. We live that way. Now, I'm not saying that God's pleased when we do it, and I'm not saying that there aren't consequences when we live unrighteously. But does our righteousness depend on our performance or on our position with God? And does our position with God depend on our performance? So what is righteousness? It's right standing with God. All right, here's the second question. Did Abraham earn it? Because this is what God is, is likening it to for us to understand. Did Abraham earn it? Well, verse 2 says, if Abraham was justified by works, another way to say that is if he earned it, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Let me Texanize this for you. All right, let me Texanize it for you. Ain't no bragging in heaven. <laughs> no one is going to walk up to you in heaven and say, you know why I'm here? Because of me. <laughs> I lived a good life. I did the right thing. I kept the faith. That's not even going to be what they say. I did it. I want you to know I'm here because of me. Listen to what everyone's going to say in heaven. I'm here because of the blood of Jesus. Amen. And the blood of Jesus only. I received it, but that's what I, I just received. You know, the Bible even says those who reign in life. You know who reigns in life? Wouldn't you like to reign in life? It says those who receive an abundance of of grace and the gift of righteousness. It's a gift. It's not earned. Verse 4 says, uh, uh, to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't work because we're saved to good works. We're, now, it's very important to understand this. This is Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. We're not saved by good works, but we're saved to good works. God does want us to live righteously. He does want us to do the right things. He does want that. He wants it for us. But we're not saved by good works, we're saved to good works. But this doesn't say, so don't do good works. That's not what it's saying. It's saying if he had worked and earned it, then it would have been a debt to God. God would have owed him righteousness. That's what it's saying. But God doesn't owe any, any man anything. So he didn't owe it. It was a gift. And it says it was accounted to him. Now this Greek word for accounted uh, is very similar to the English word accounting. And literally what it means is to put into an account. So God put righteousness in Abraham's account.
me draw this for you, um, and, and I'm hoping that this will always be in your mind from now. Let's uh, do um, three accounts. These, these containers are going to be like accounts, all right? And what we'll do is we'll do three different accounts. We'll do an account of um, we'll do an account of a bad person, a good person, and a perfect person. All right. Now the perfect person would be whom? Jesus. All right. Jesus, the only person, perfect person that's ever lived. All right. Uh, I want to do the account of a bad person. Let me think of a bad person. Okay, I got one. This bad, this bad guy. I've known this guy for a long time now, and he's done a lot of bad things wrong. He, he even uh, has bad thoughts. He's just a bad guy. He's just bad. He's bad. So, um, and a good person. Let me think. Um, okay, no one in particular. Just, um, <laughs> this is just a good person. All right. Known, known her for a long time too. Okay. All right. Now um, we're gonna have a code here. S is going to stand for sin. R is going to stand for righteous. All right? Righteous sin deeds, righteous deeds. All right? Okay. So, now let's, let's look at Robert's account before he got saved. All right? Before he got saved, this is what his account looked like. And he had a few, he had a few righteous deeds. He did a few good things. He did a, no, that one righteous. Okay. All right, that's what my account looked like before I got saved. Now, Debbie's account, on the other hand, was different. You got to remember, she was raised differently, and she, uh, well, actually, we were raised both pretty much the same way, but I was bad, and she was good. So, um, I got saved, she's, I got saved in a motel room. Uh, she got saved in her grandmother's living room watching Billy Graham. So, we, we had, okay. So, Debbie's life, she had a lot of righteous things. I mean, she did a lot of good things before she got saved. Basically, her account really did look like this with a few. <laughs> a few little S's in it. Now, I want you to think about this too, by the way. There are some of you here that re really relate to this. You had a lot of sin in your account before you got saved. Would you agree with that? Okay. And there's some of you that really relate to Debbie. You, you really, you know, you got saved at six or whatever, you know. I mean, I got delivered from drugs. She got delivered from bubble gum, you know. So. <laughs> and some of you relate to Debbie. You really do. You, you got saved as a child. You didn't have that many S's in your account. But you had some, didn't you? Sure you did. Everybody does. Okay. Jesus' account. Let's just do it this way. Right? This is righteous. Did he have any S's in his account? No. Okay, now, even though I got a few R's, and let's say Debbie had a lot of R's. There's, a still, there's still one problem. There's a difference between our R's and Jesus' R. Did you know that? There's still a difference. Let me tell you the difference. This is a good verse for us to... Remember, I, Isaiah 64, 6, this is what it says. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. All our R's are as filthy rags. So actually, this R down here could stand for rags. So even though Debbie's got a lot of R's in her account before she gets saved, really, her righteousness compared to God's righteousness, really, it's just R's, rags. She just had a bunch of, she had more rags in her account than I had rags in my account. <laughs> Never thought about it that way. <laughs> you had more filthy rags in your account than I had in mine? Okay. <clears throat> It makes me feel good. I just, okay. Uh, might make one of these a little bigger. All right. <laughs> 
Okay, if Jesus looks at my account, how am I going to get to go to heaven? It's just a bunch of S's. And even my R's aren't good enough. So here's what happened. Grace. One day a guy said to me in a motel room, and Debbie's grandmother said to her in her living room, Jesus died for you. He paid for your sins. And when I believed that, he took all of the R's out of his account and put them in my account. And he took all of the S's out of my account and put them in his account. You have to catch this. And the father now looks at my account and says, you live. But he looked at his son's account and said, you die. That's why Jesus died. Jesus died because God took all of my sin and put it in his account. But I get to live because he took his son's righteousness and put it in my account. Do you, do you follow that? So how did Abraham get it? He believed. Here's the, here's the third question that I want to ask you. What did Abraham have to do? What, what did he have to do? He had to believe. Uh, John 6, verse 28. They said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works, plural, of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work, singular, of God that you believe in him whom he sent. Notice the word works and the word work. They said, what, what are the works of God? Tell us the works of God that we may do them. Jesus said, there's only one work that you have to do. There's just one. You have to believe in him whom he sent. Now, here's the thing about this story that is so amazing that I really think we miss, Okay. When we think of Abraham, we think of the father of our faith. Galatians talks about him as those, he's the father of faith, and those who believe are children of Abraham and children of God, all right? The only problem is that we don't think about what Abraham was like before God came to him. Here, here's what I want you to understand. Abraham, I, I know this, this is going to shock you, but I have to say it. Abraham was a heathen before God came to him. And that's hard for us to understand. I, I can remember even talking with someone one time, and this person said, no, uh, Abraham was, was a, a, a Jewish person. Not then. There were no Jewish people. This is Genesis 12. This is way before Moses, way before the law. Abraham was, a, was not a part of a, 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 a godly nation or the nation of God. He was a part of a heathen nation. God called him out of that nation. He's just a heathen. So someone even said to me, well, yeah, but he was a part of Israel. No, Israel was his grandson. Israel had not even been born yet. So this is just a, a, a heathen that's a part of a heathen nation. He doesn't know anything about God. Or what he does know is, has been distorted. And, and so God just shows up one day. He just, he just shows up. And I want you to think about this. Um, what, what if he had told Abraham the night before that he wanted to talk to him the next day? How well do you think Abraham would have slept? <laughs> well, think about it this way. If before you were saved, before you were saved, if God said to you, I want to talk to you tomorrow, how well would you have slept? <laughs> what would you think God was coming to do? And again, I'm not trying to put Abraham down because I, I got a lot more S's in mind. I know that. But, but think, just think with me for a moment. Um, what was he like before he got saved, before he believed? Okay, here's something we can think about. What was he like after he believed? Now listen to me. After, after he believed, he lied about his wife. Twice and was going to let a, a, a king sleep with her to save his own skin. This was after he believed. 
after he believed, he slept with his maid and had a child out of wedlock. After he believed. L listen to me. What was he like before he believed? <laughs> he did that stuff after he believed. Okay, so God shows up to Abraham. This is how amazing this covenant is that he's trying to tell us and help us understand. And we're going to pick up on this next week because Hebrews says in the same way, in the same way, he comes to us, but even better. That's what Hebrews says. All right, so here's what happens. God shows up to Abraham, and he's a heathen. And here's what God says to him. Now, Abraham, you're probably thinking all these different things that I'm going to say to you. But I, I want you to understand something. I did not come today to judge you. And I could. And I didn't come to condemn you. One of the greatest verses in the Bible is John 3, 17. Verse 16, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. Listen, listen to this, God did not. God did not. God did not come to you to condemn you, and he could have, but he didn't. Abraham, I didn't come to judge you, I didn't come to condemn you, and I didn't come to clean your clock, and I could. I didn't come. I came today for one reason. One reason, Abraham. I came to you today, listen to this, to bless you. And Abraham believed and righteousness was put in his account. That's what this story tells us. In the same way, but even better. I'm going to read you the verse that says that. In the same way, but even better. That's what Hebrews says. God comes to us. And God comes to you and says, listen to me. Given your upbringing and given what you've heard about me, how demanding I am and how legalistic I am and how judgmental I am, given all you've heard about me, this is going to be hard for you to believe. But I didn't come today to judge you. And I didn't come to condemn you. I came to bless you. And if you believe, then God takes all of the sin out of your account and puts it in his son's account. And he takes righteousness out of his son's account and puts it in your account, and you get to go to heaven. Is that not good? That's the righteousness of grace. Now, listen to me carefully. Listen. Here's the temptation for those of us who've been saved 10, 15, 20, 30 years now, 50 years, whatever it is. Here's the temptation to now work it out by the flesh. It's exactly what Abraham did. <laughs> After he believed that God was going to bless him, years later, he decides he's got to work it out by the flesh. But listen to me, this is so good if you ever catch this. It didn't change the promise of God. It didn't change the faithfulness of God even though Abraham decided to work it out by the flesh, God was still faithful. I'm telling you, the righteousness of grace is so much better than the righteousness of works. And you just have to receive it. I was 19 years old when I gave my life to the Lord and everything changed. I didn't have any desire to go back to that old life I wanted to walk with the Lord and learn more about Him. And some people helped me to learn the Bible and to learn how to pray and to learn about my new life in Christ. And that's what we want to do for you. I am so excited that you've given your life to the Lord. He's forgiven all of your sins and you're on your way to heaven. But we need to learn some things now about the Bible, about prayer, about some basics of the Christian life so that you can be victorious and live for the Lord like I know you want to. 
So we've designed a class called Fresh Start. And I want to encourage you to sign up for this class because we want to help you grow in your walk with the Lord now. I love you, and I am so proud of you.